this. Okay, so we've got as far as the <laughs> we've got as far as the type checker, which is the box just at the top, produces this HS sin of ID. The next thing that happens in the compiler is desugar takes the gigantic core data, that gigantic HS sin data type with its hundreds of constructors and, and many tens of data types, and turns it into core expert, which really is very small. It has nine data, nine, nine data constructors and only two or three types. It's really very small indeed. So this is an incredible sort of funnel thing. It makes it from a very, very big language into an astonishingly small language. I don't, I think it's, um, uh, of any smaller language that can be used as country compilers, richer language as Haskell. Then it goes through a, the sort of middle, the middle end of compiler, or strength the of that, um, laughingly called the simplifier. <laughs> um, so, um, the, uh, so this is a sequence of core-to-core -core passes, so they're all core-to-core, -core, and they, um, uh, and I've listed the, um, I've listed the most important ones here. The simplifier itself, is a, um, uh, a fairly complicated pass that tries to do a lot of simple rewrites all at once. Inlining, constant folding, um, uh, case of case expressions, bits of, um, and um, uh, applying rewrite rules, and it tries to cascade all these things in a, um, so that they, you can do a lot of them in one pass. And it, so the simplify itself is the most complicated of all of these. The strictness analyzer is actually a lot less complicated than the simplifier, and it does just what it sounds like. It does strictness analysis, and then it does the uh, transformation called the worker wrapper transformation, which, it, which expresses the results of strictness analysis in such a way that the subsequent application of the simplifier can exploit it. Oh, I should say that the plan for this middle of the compiler is you go uh, do, do some transformations that you might think would improve efficiency. Apply the simplifier to sort of work out the consequences and get rid of all the junk and then apply another transformation and apply the simplifier again. So the idea is that most of the individual transformations, these ones, can operate in the knowledge that the simplifier will subsequently clean up their litter. They don't need to worry about eliminating dead code or inlining things. They can generate stuff that the simplifier will later clean up. Let floating means moving let bindings outwards and inwards. Uh, specializing overloaded functions is for Haskell style overloading. You might want to um, make specialized versions of that particular types. Makes them a lot more efficient. And constructor specialization is when you have a recursive function where at the recursive call, you see the function applied to, already applied to a pair, already applied to true or false, and you can specialize the body of fun the function with respect to some information about the arguments. This turns out to be incredibly effective in certain kinds of programs. Now, just carrying on with this sort of overview then, after, the, after this sort of middle stuff happens, and at the moment this middle stuff is uh, described, the, the, the sequence of passes is described in Haskell code, but in a very well-defined place. I think I, I've written some notes about where. And so you could easily change the order of passes, but you then have to rebuild GHC to do that. One, one of the projects we put on, on the list would be, it'd be really nice to um, be able to script this, so that you could say, you could read a script from some uh, input file that would essentially be a little domain-specific language for describing the sequence of transformations. Could be, to be fairly straightforward to do that. After that, the tidier phase um, happens, which, and what does the tidying phase do? The tidying phase do, the, its, its main variant is that after this point, we can generate interface files, and so all the information that goes into interface files must now be stable, right? No nonsense about changing arities or strictnesses or unfoldings or anything. So, this is the point at which you might, uh, or this is also the point at which you might generate byte codes, I think. Um, uh, and everything from here on we consider as part of the code generator and could, you know, there's a, it, it must generate code that matches that specification. Um, core prep sets things up ready for the conversion to STG. So the biggest single thing that it does is to convert to a normal form. That means making sure the function arguments are all variables. Um, it also does things like saturating constructors to make sure, and saturating primitive operations. So it adds extra invariants that aren't required at this earlier phase, but still in call out. And then now we're still in call out, but with a whole lot of extra invariants. So we're ready to convert to the STG language, which I'll put this sketch in a sec. Um, and from the SDU language, it goes to the code generator, which is a rather big, complicated pass I'd like to split up. 
And this is the point at which we get C minus minus. So not C minus minus in its textual form, but a data type called the CNN data type that is then either spat out in C syntax via a kind of funny kind of pretty printer, or else is fed into the machine code, uh, native code generator, which generates some native code here. Okay. But the place that, and, all, and there's a, the dash F CMM flag, we just pretty printed as C minus minus. Okay, yeah. You said there's a big funnel from HS sin to core. Yes. Um, having gone through that funnel, essentially no errors are reported, no user errors are reported. True, right? yes. The desugarer used to have the property that it, it, it well, used to have the property that the type checker was the last time any user errors could be reported. Now that we've got um, template Haskell, uh, it turns out that it's a bit inconvenient to really make sure there are no user errors in a desugarer. So now the desugarer is able to report user errors, but it's, it's rather unusual. Almost all errors are either rename or type checker. And after the desugarer, absolutely no user errors. It's the business of the everything from the desugar onwards to just get on with the job. Yeah. Um, why does the type checker happen um, so early? Oh, right. So why don't we type check after here, or after desugar, right? Or even after simplify. Oh, 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 well, come So the simplifier. Because well, I see type check is like you're doing a lot of work with these giant data structures, yes. all these code happening. Could it be simplified by moving the type checker to later parts. So of having a type checker later in the compilation pipeline is a much more conventional design. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite common to say, take the big syntax, desugar it, and now type check it. Mm -hmm. But it places a lot of constraints on desugar, and desugar must maintain the static semantics of the language completely. Right. So that's that's quite a big constraint. Mm -hmm. And it also and therefore it, by implication it places a big constraint on the language into which you desugar. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, our language here the core language into which we desugar is a typed language. So we couldn't, we can't desugar it until we have the types. Right? So you could have a different small intermediate language into which you desugar it and then type, but that would be another language in between. Another thing is to do with error messages. By, by type checking the original program, you can guarantee that you're seeing exactly what the programmer wrote and you can report errors in that form. And in practice, my, my judgment about this is this has worked out pretty well. That though it is a big data type, the bits where, oh, it's just the same all over again, they're the bits that you can just do on that relaxing Sunday <laughs> afternoon you know, while you're thinking about something else. And the intricate, tricky bits are, not going to, are only going to be made worse by having to sort of compose your type checker with a previous desugaring phase and make sure that it's all worked out. So in other words, the, the bits that have become higher volume are not the difficult bits. And the difficult bits don't really become easier or more difficult. So there's, there's just more volume, but it's not. It's not actually real work. But for debugging purposes, you do have a type checker for the core. Aha, right, yes. So, uh, well, I'm not going to buy you. Yeah. Uh, back up a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, right, so let, let, let's just mention that. So, core is a type check language. We're just about to look at it. There is a type checker for it called lint, core lint. And it is very useful for uh, type checking the program after every transformation. It's really, really good at finding bugs. Um, in your code. So the very first thing that you should do in a, uh, if you ever find anything wrong with your compiler, you know, something strange is happening, switch on lint. It's not actually on by default because it, it costs something to run. But switch on lint and very often it'll nail it right away. Immediately the thing has gone wrong, it'll, it'll nail it. This is the, the intermediate language here. It's, it's actually quite difficult to get a program, a, a transformation that is correct, uh, sorry, is wrong, but still maintains types. Um, quick check for GHC. Okay. It's kind of it's kind of like that. Yes. Uh, just before leaving this diagram, let me remark that um, in this stage here, we then take this uh, sort of final core program, convert it into iFace sin, which is in this directory iFace compiler iFace, iFace sin and iFace types are the two main modules that define the data types, and. This, is, this, this contains all the interesting work, and then finally there's a binary serialization step to generate the HI file. So we separated in this two. First we had a kind of serialized direct from here, but that was too much going on at once. So it's much nicer to do this two-step process. This, is, this iFace sin type is not, it's not tiny, but it's not all that big either. And it was, uh, was a, and originally we, this was HS sin all over again. But it, it's so much better to have a data type dedicated to this specific purpose. So there it is. Um, so now we've got at least three representations of types, for example. 
We've got HS types for the programmer's versions. We've got types for the main belly of the beast. And we've got iFace types for, that's what types get turned into in this syntax. But provided you know the, the way the, the flow is going and what the purpose is, it's actually easier sometimes to have different data types for different purposes, even if they share some common structure. Okay. 